Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. Today we have with us Thomas Pelson. They say about him that he's a creative director, an editor, a brand consultant. Which one of these definitions you prefer and who are you if you have to define yourself? Well, I think I would choose editor, although I do work across many different fields in fashion and publishing. But editor is the thing that is closest to my heart. It's close to your heart because quite a long time ago with Jerry Johansson, yes. your friend, you created a very, very special book, magazine, I don't know how to define, which is Acne Paper, right? That's right. And it went on for many years, 10 years, 205 to 15. Yes. And then you stopped. And then you started again now. And you have a new issue of this book. You will tell me what it is with the title of Nocturne. Why did you stop and why did you start again? <laughs> well, we did Acne Paper for 10 years. And a lot of things happens in 10 years. And Acne Paper was an incredible journey, both for Acne and Johnny and for me professionally. It was an experiment to start with. It was really a fashion brand that wanted to create a publication that would reflect upon... I mean, the fashion brand is Acne, right? Yes. But uh, the magazine has nothing to do with that, in a way. I mean, No, it did in the beginning. We photographed the clothes of Acne, and then we realized that, you know, if we are going to be perceived as a magazine with integrity, we needed to open it up and also feature other brands and talk about things that did not have anything to do with the brand directly. It was more like a cultural extension of the cultural mindset of the brand in a way. And to answer your question that, you know, during these 10 years, Acne, that became, it was Acne Jeans, then it became Acne, then it became Acne Studios, had changed and um, was moving in a much more contemporary way, whereas Acne Paper in the first incarnation was a bit nostalgic, maybe. It looked a lot towards history while keeping a keen eye on contemporary culture. And I think it was just time. We had made 14 amazing issues, or 15, and uh, we sort of decided to take a break. And that pause lasted for six years. <laughs> so, so you decided to do a new edition. First of all, a new series. Can you describe, because more or less the, the acne of before and the acne of today, first of all, they have the same title, which is paper. Yes, and yes. this has a specific meaning, the fact that it's called paper. It's not a magazine. It's not a hundred pages. It's a huge book in a way you know it's over 500 pages can you tell me more about paper and about the magazine itself i don't know if it is a magazine a book or whatever it is an object yes no it is hard to define acne paper the word paper came because it's made of paper and paper also being a newspaper in the beginning the format was very much like a newspaper a bit we were inspired by magazines like Andy Warhol's interview that printed on sort of newspaper. It was a newspaper format in a way. And the first acne paper had that sort of large format. They also wanted to have the brand name included. And it was Johnny's brilliant idea to call it acne paper. I think acne paper, more than anything, is sort of a laboratory of editorial ideas. And, you know, they gave me creative freedom to do whatever I wanted with it, obviously with their approval. So it became also a very personal project for me in the sense that it was a place where I could be curious. And I guess much like you, Anna, to be curious in other people, to look around, to find uh, people, subjects, things that I was interested in, and to gather all of these in a printed publication. 
And each issue of Acne Paper, what kind of has always been special about it is that it's all created around a specific subject each time. So there's a theme for each issue. And this theme instructs us, creates a filter, a lens that we have to see everything through. So for instance, this last issue, which is Nocturne, it's about the night. And it's a wonderful way to kind of, in a way, narrow things down a little bit instead of, you know, I am interested in everything between the earth and the sky. And the theme gives it a kind of a context in which we can explore a subject. People that Artists, for instance, if we take Nocturne as an example, that works with who are inspired by the night and maybe artists who works during the night or writers that write during the night, musicians, and also the fashion, which then, of course, it's inspired by the night. So it becomes almost like I've always looked at Acne Paper as a sort of a cinematic magazine in a way that a film has its own mood, its own kind of light, its own sense of sonography and tone and a message that it wants to bring across. I've always looked at that in the paper in a way as, as a, how would I do a film about the night or how would I do something about the body or elegance or, or Manhattan, which was a great issue. Let's say that you and Johnny they were youth friends, you have a Scandinavian taste in a yes. way, right? I and guess so. this is reflected in the acne paper and what more or less is this Scandinavian taste vis-a-vis -vis other tastes? I guess I have a certain Scandinavian-ness about me and I guess to a certain degree Acne Studios has that as well. But I don't know if my taste is particularly Scandinavian. I grew up with a grandmother who was French-American. I moved from Norway when I was 26. I've lived in, in London and Paris and Milan. So I think the taste is quite international. But I would say that maybe there is a purity there. There is a purity of design that might be a Scandinavian sensitivity. I don't know. There is maybe a sense of honesty, a sense of clarity, a sense of the quality, perhaps. But it's a difficult question. I don't feel... And besides really beautiful photographs, sometimes of real clothes, sometimes of just images, fantasy images, in the text, the many articles or interviews for instance a beautiful article by natasha fraser about the, yes. the very end of frederic chopin in paris this ending days and then you can have a article on frederic mal about perfume scent or paolo colombo about art right so what are you looking for special moments special people Yes, all of the above, I would say. I'm very fortunate to have, through all these years of making this magazine, wonderful contributors around me. So when I come up with the theme of the issue, I share this with people like Natasha, who is a beautiful writer, as you know. So I would talk to Natasha about the subject and she would come up with some brilliant ideas for it. And so I do this with all my contributors. So in a way, and maybe that's why I say editor is probably the thing that I identify with the most is because I put the subject out there and then I gather all these amazing ideas from these very talented people. And then I put it together in a way that is about how, what is the mood, you know, then the art director comes in and we create this beautiful And where thing. can one find your magazine? You, <laughs> it is, uh, you sell it online, it's in the bookstores? In it's distributed globally, so it will, would be in all the sort of big uh, magazine stores around the world. It will be in specialized shops that sell beautiful publications, in galleries, uh, museums have it. We cover a lot of contemporary art and also we work a lot with museums. So you would find it there and you can find it online as well. And are you preparing a new 
issue. I mean, we are actually preparing the twentieth anniversary issue. Yes, that's coming out in the spring. So in the spring, it will be twenty years since we first launched Acne Paper, and it also happens to be issue twenty. So it's a big. It has a title. It does, but I'm not allowed to talk about that yet. Okay. <laughs> so, but when you make a pause, let's say between the first Acne papers and the ones who are starting again, you did a lot of things from 2013 to 16 on. I mean, you directed, for instance, advertising campaign for famous designers like Chanel, like Armani, like Hermès, like Vuitton. Evden, Pelagamo, and so on and so forth. What does it mean? What did you do? My first client, let's say, after Acne Studios, because I started Acne Paper directly after I graduated from St. Martin's, it was actually Hermes that contacted me because they had seen Acne Paper and the magazine resonated with what they wanted to maybe investigate a little bit for their men's visual communication for their men's collection. So I started my career as an art director in the fashion industry with Hermes and I I created these kind of these booklets where I come up with an idea for how the collection should be shot, suggestions of photographers, and also the layout, how it's going to be designed. So I did with Hermes a few of these projects, which was very wonderful because they do a beautiful product and an incredible brand. But I think my biggest sort of job in the fashion industry was with Giorgio Armani. So I was called by Giorgio Armani to meet with Mr. Armani because they were looking for someone who could help him and the brand with all their advertising across all the Armani brands. So this was really a very big job that was an incredible opportunity, very, very challenging because Armani is a huge brand with so many projects that needs to be done. So this was my, really my school and my... And Armani is started by doing vitrines, you know, yes. before being a designer. He, he is a very demanding person, I mean, which is probably the key of his great success over the years. No, he's a very precise and uh, has a specific taste. Must be a very interesting personal experience. Absolutely incredible person, rigorous, extremely talented, completely dedicated to his creation. And he was very demanding, but he was also incredibly inspiring. And I think I learned a lot, especially about photography, from him because that was my job to come up with ideas and suggestions for photographers. How are we going to present every new collection in photography? He's a, a remarkable man with an incredible taste, a unique vision, someone who knows exactly what he wants. And um, so to kind of, you have to, when you work for him, tap into his universe and try to understand the Giorgio Armani style and how that can be translated into photography. And I think that was a very interesting As time. we are into photography, because books and magazines are still your love, let's say, your yes. passion, you edited two books uh, on the legendary photographer Lord Snowden, right? That's right, yes. And also with his daughter, Frances, you founded together another magazine, called luncheon yes right yes, we that did 216 yeah. uh, why this particular interested for snowdon and for luncheon I mean, were you personal friends or what happened well snowdon was a photographer that i came across as a student when i was at st martin's and i spent most of my student years in the library and of course snowdon is one of the great photographers of his generation. And so when we did Acne Paper, I wanted to include sort of master photographers. So I actually wrote him a letter and asked if he would be interested in photographing students and teachers at Central St. Martins, thinking that he would never 
be interested in our magazine mm-hmm. or such a request having shot i mean he's done huge portfolios for vanity fair for he shot for vogue i mean he's an, an incredible photographer especially on portraiture but he said yes to do it so mm-hmm. we met at the first time you know at central st martins in the college where i used to go and spent the whole day together photographing students and teachers there and from there we started working on other projects together and sort of became friends and francis yes his daughter i had heard about because we had many mutual friends but for years we didn't meet and then one day i got an email from francis asking if we could meet which we did, which was a very awkward meeting. She had a cup of tea and I had a pint of beer. And (laughs) that was sort of like, but at that time she was in charge of the Snowden archive and she was interested in doing a project about her father's blue shirts, which he often photographed. Sometimes he photographed his sitters with shirts that was his own that was he had a stack of shirts in his dark room in his studio in london and sometimes he asked them if he felt like the sitter wasn't wearing something that he liked he would ask her him to wear one of his shirts so these shirts were always on francis mind and so francis had this idea of making a book about portraits of people photographed in those shirts and also photographed in the color blue because most of these shirts were blue. Snowden's favorite color was blue. This was a brilliant idea, actually, for Acne Studios, you know, having a history in jeans. So the first project was Snowden Blue, this book of portraits of people wearing blue. And then it was published by Acne Studios together with a little collection of shirts that they made inspired by Snowden's shirt. So it was an incredible sort of dialogue between this photographer and and his work and this fashion brand that just came together and it became a very successful project for everybody. And there was this synergy between the generations because Acne being a kind of a young brand, Snowden being an older photographer, but these two worlds can merge in a very beautiful way. But also um, you created the magazine Luncheon. Yes. Is, how come? I mean, After having worked with, you know, the commercial side of the fashion industry for some time, I was really longing to get back to magazines, which is my passion. And Francis and I had during this time, since we did Snowden Blue, become very close friends. And Frances, you know, she grew up with photography, she grew up with magazines, and she had already contributed to Acne Paper and as in a wonderful way as a she journalist. She worked with Paolo Roversi. Yes, with really. Paolo Roversi. She worked with Paolo for many years. We thought, should we just do a magazine together? And that's what we did. And the idea of luncheon was that, you know, we used to meet over lunch. Mm -hmm. And we always talked about ideas and creativity. We talked about people. So we thought this is actually really a good idea for a magazine to do a magazine where we meet people over lunch. And with that, you know, you can do things on food, food and fashion, food and art, food and conversation. So it was actually a very, very good idea for a magazine. And also the dungeon is so nice, you know. (laughs) But then in 2018 you went back to something more commercial, I would say. I don't know if it's a word, but you went back to a famous brand, which is Vogue, and uh, you became the creative director of Warm of Vogue in Italy. Yes. That was another experience with mixed fashion and uh, magazine, no, in a way. The Armani, Chanel, Hermès, and so on, and magazine. It didn't last very long, this experience, right? Well, I was there for three years. Emanuele Farnetti had, as you know, been appointed as the new editor-in-chief of Vogue Italia after Franca Zuzani. They closed Luomo Vogue down and then they relaunched it. And he was looking for a creative director to work with him. And I've always dreamt, I mean, since I was a child, I've been dreaming about, you know, working for Vogue. I mean, it's the greatest fashion magazine in the world. 
I was completely overjoyed by this opportunity to work on a Vogue and also, I mean, Luomo Vogue that is so different from all the other Vogues. First of all, it's a, it's a men's fashion magazine. It's Italian. It has an incredible history. I mean, it started in the 60s, I believe. And that was an incredible thing because I immediately went into the archives. I discovered how innovative Lomo Vogue was. And the challenge was, of course, how we are going to translate this into today, which we did by making it in English, making it much more international. It was three very, very interesting years. But then Acne Paper came back and that's why I, I stopped. I could have continued with Luomo, but Johnny approached me and asked if I wanted was would be interested in starting Acne Paper again, which I was. And, and Acne Paper is a full-time job or you stopped directing global advertising for fashion brands? I mean, you're back to be just an editor now? No, I do do other things. So I work with some Italian brands. Again, funnily, Italy has been the country where I've uh, been working the most in terms of fashion. But then I also do other books. So I'm doing my second book together with Robin Muir on Cecil Beaton. I've been doing books with Dolce Gabbana. A book with Mary McCartney. Two books with Mary McCartney. So I've been working a lot with print. So it's not just a magazine. I mean, it's only once per year. And even if it's 500 pages, you still need other work to but pay it's bills. It's interesting that in a world where newspapers and magazines are less and less important, uh, they're less and less read. And in the same time, the books, all sorts of books, from coffee table books to literature, from essays or whatever, they're still in. I mean, people still want books. We can see because you have a library on your back and I do have one <laughs> yes. too when we're doing the interview. And uh, no, but the book and that kind of magazine, which can be a collection also. So it can be a collecting item in a way, right? They remain. Absolutely. I think there is something that, about the book and the magazines that when... Some magazines. No, some no, no. magazines, when they're well done, the internet and social media can't really compete with it because it's an object, has a physical presence in your room. It has an edit that is very considered from the cover to the opening, to how things are structured, how it feels, all of that, that is a sensory experience as well as the content inside. But for me, it's very much the edit because when a book is beautifully done, let's say an illustrated book or a book of photography, it is considered, it's someone who's really thought about, you know, how are we going to open it? What is the first image someone is going to see? On social media, you just scroll and it's all sorts of, it's like, sort of like, a, it's a huge noisy situation. Whereas the book is very, it's a silent, much more meditative experience. I think that is something that people will always want. I don't believe that we always just want to have a screen. You know, it, it is also a home with books. It's a warm home. Is it's, the cover very important? The cover is very important, yes. It's the Does first it take a long time to make the choice of the right cover? I mean, the cover you think? Um, I always know which image I would like on the cover quite immediately. It stands out. For acne paper, especially, it's also because it belongs to a series, you know, so it's always in the context of what we've done before. So for me, there's always one favorite image that sings to me. So it's not a difficult choice. It's more difficult to how are we going to show this image and the typography, the color, the quality of the paper, all of those things takes longer. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, the fact that there's still, you know, in a world uh, like the one we are, right, everything is quick. Uh, the fact uh, that there are still some magazines like yours or some others, you know, also literary magazines like the Paris Review or the Granta magazine or things like that means that maybe the book has a certain respect that other things don't have, right? 
And to own a book, to own that quality magazine is not only luxury in the sense that it's like, you know, you have an Hermes bag and your Mm. magazine, but it's also an intellectual luxury, right? Maybe it's not a mass market product, right? It's not millions of copies and things like this, not a scoop, but it is a a long tradition, the one of the magazines, right? And there is a sophisticated public for it, including students or including intellectuals or people who just have respect and give importance to own a book. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I think your intellectual luxury is very, very good. It is that, because many of these books are quite expensive, but it's something that definitely I want to have. I mean, I want to have it in my library. I want to look at it. I want to have its presence. And um, it's an interesting time for magazines, which is sort of my area. Before you would have magazines that were made to make money with advertising and to earn money was one of the most important reasons for making this magazine. Whereas now it's not. You have people making magazines because of their love of magazines, because they want to create something in paper. And that has, it's become a new generation of magazine makers where it's about the making of a magazine, how it's printed. It's not just about the content. It's not about selling anything. It's just about the passion for the creation of a magazine in itself. And also, I mean, a magazine is a beautiful way to connect with the world. I mean, when you're making a magazine, you have a wonderful opportunity to reach out to people that you're interested in, artists, uh, photographers, writers, people that you would like to approach, that you would like to work with. And I think when you do something on the printed page, it means much, much more to all these people than if it's only online. I believe so. No, it it's not on the question of online. I mean, I just want to give an example. I mean, you okay. said you worked for one of Vogue, but, but you talk about Vogue and um, Condé Nast uh, world, for instance. Uh, this is what I had the impression that your kind of magazine and that kind of magazine restores. I mean, in the past, also, maybe they wanted to make money, but this Vogue, they used to have very important writers writing mm. for them, uh, or very important artists uh, working on the covers or on the photographs. I mean, there was a cultural need, and not only fashion, right? I mean, all fashion was molded into a cultural environment. Right. I mean, absolutely. And so we have examples of famous writers or poets or, you know, that work in that kind of magazine. And today, with the excuse that you have to sell it, that is less and less happening. Right. Yes. Yes. I have the feeling that without being nostalgic, that you have this desire to recuperate this tradition. Right. Mm. Absolutely. I may be wrong. I mean, no, I, you're absolutely just... right. I completely agree. When I look at old Vogues, you know, I spent a lot of time in the Vogue archives when they were still on Hanover Square. You are blown away by the contributors and the artistic integrity of these issues because. As you say, they involve the greatest writers of the time, the greatest artists. Artists were commissioned to do covers. They were experimental. They were groundbreaking. They were doing something that the world had never seen before. And of course, today, it's a very different picture. It's much more commercial. It's about celebrity, a lot of that. And of course, there's still incredible writers and photographers working for magazines like Vogue. But for me personally, it's not a magazine for me anymore. I'm not interested in it in a way because I'd rather, you know, look at the old editions, which maybe makes me nostalgic. But for me, it's more interesting for what I do, because with Acne Paper, we have an opportunity to be experimental, to include great contemporary artists, to do a cover, 
So we're much more aligned with how a magazine like Vogue used to be. But at uh, the same time, you're not involved in politics. No, no. nowadays everything is politics and yeah. economy, and which is obviously extremely interesting and important. But uh, it's like if you were looking to show how the importance of beauty also in this world, or sophisticated beauty, yes. or not. Sophisticated beauty, yes. We have a great luxury because we don't have to get into the politics of finance and power. And that allows us to choose what we think is the best right now, completely independently of everything that's going on. So I don't know if that is sophisticated, but we can sort of cherry pick a little bit and of course, I mean, there's people that also say no to being part of our magazine, which I uh, understand as well. But I don't know if that answers your question. Let's to go back to Acne Paper. You have total freedom to choose and to do what you want. But in the same time, and this emphasizes the concept of freedom, you said, I have to do the best of this because I have nobody to blame. Yeah. <laughs> This is true. <laughs> yes. yes, of course, I can't hide behind an editor because uh, in the end, I'm making the decisions. We have some parameters, let's say, and the world is very sensitive to certain topics. And there's also cultural considerations that we need to consider. But all of this is also great. I mean, we have a committee in the magazine that we discuss everything with. So everything has to go through a kind of an, an approval process, let's say. But it's all about culture and it's not political in that sense. But yeah, I can't hide behind anyone, that's for sure. Thank you very much for this uh, conversation. And, Thank uh, you. In advance, I wish you a very happy 20th anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. Looking for next issue of Acne. And I believe that uh, your readers must be very happy that you went back to that and to publish oh, it. I hope no. so. <laughs> but I you didn't so. tell me the reason why you went back. Maybe the time just felt ready. I think maybe we missed each other as well. We, I think we missed working together and seeing each other and doing this magazine, which was such an important part of both our lives. So yeah, it's great to be back and it's great to be doing it. I hope that people think the same. Can we say that it's an homage to friendship? Absolutely. I think that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Alan L. Can interviews.